Reading from God's Word in Luke 17, beginning at verse 22. And he said to his disciples, The days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look here, or look there. Do not go out and follow them. For as the lightning flashes and the lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They will be eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Our Father, we, as always, pray that you will Teach us from this passage of Scripture that we have before us this morning. Hide the messenger, Lord. We are, we are ruined if you don't do that. But we pray that your Holy Spirit will be the one who ministers this word to our hearts. Whatever it is that we need, by way of comfort, by way of challenge, by way of conviction, we pray that it will be coming from you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. High school uh, composition class, if you can remember back that far. The teacher said uh, for this exam, uh, you will have to write a paper, and your paper will be on this subject. The subject is what, W-H-A-T, what. Well, that sent a lot of the people into an hour-long you know, frenzy trying to figure out <laughs> what do I write about what. But one guy finished in one minute. His composition, so what? So what? I mean, I guess that's about as big an expression of indifference as you could possibly have, isn't it? So what? Incredibly, to me, this was the reaction that Jesus got from most people. I mean, after all the amazing miracles that Jesus did, which, of course, people got excited about at the time, after all the authoritative teaching, when we're told that they looked at him as one who taught with authority and not as the scribes and Pharisees, he was a great preacher. After the way that he had an undefeated record against those who came to try and trick him, the smartest people of his day were coming at Jesus constantly with verbal traps, and he won every single time. And yet at the end of all of that, when the final verdict of the nation Israel came in, the verdict was, so what? Who cares? That's amazing. It's amazing. And yet that's what it was. He didn't fit their mold. He didn't do exactly what, he, what they thought he should do. So their verdict was to reject him. But in doing so, of course, they sealed their own fate. Apathy, indifference to the Word of God to the person of Christ always leads to destruction in the end. Cannot be indifferent to him. And so as we come to this passage, that's the theme of our message today. Indifference leads to destruction. Jesus has just emphasized to the Pharisees, if you were with us last week, that his kingdom has a spiritual dimension. It's a dimension that will come and you won't be able to observe it because it's happening in the hearts of people. But having made that point, Jesus now turns to his disciples and he begins to talk to them about the physical dimension of the kingdom because there is a physical dimension. The problem is it's not coming now as they expected it to. They thought when Messiah arrives on the scene, and this certainly is Messiah, the kingdom will certainly follow in short order the physical manifestation of it. And Jesus' message is, it's not coming, guys. It is not coming immediately like you think. 
but it will come. It is coming. It's just not coming when you think. But he gives them now instruction regarding when that kingdom does come. It's all tied to his second coming, which of course they didn't really know anything about at this point in time. And he gives them eight characteristics of what this kingdom will be like when it comes. Started to look at those last week. Saw the first three. The first one, that Jesus' coming is desired by true believers. This is one of the characteristics of the hearts of believers. You, we, we want to get out of this sin-laden world and get to a place where there isn't any of that dragging us down. And so we long for the coming of the kingdom of God. Jesus' coming is not yet for the disciples. In verse 22, we saw that in their lifetime, Jesus is basically informing them they will not see this culmination or manifestation of the kingdom. <laughs> Thirdly, Jesus' coming will be unmistakable when it does come. It's not going to be secret. It's not going to be sneaky. It's not going to be this group and nobody else knows about it. It's going to be everybody in the world will know when Jesus comes again. So he makes that point. But by now he realizes they're going to be wondering, well, okay, this is great, but why, why not now? Why can't it come now? And so we go to the fourth point that he makes here about the kingdom, and that is this. Jesus' coming is delayed by rejection. Jesus' coming is delayed by rejection. Verse 25 of Luke 17. He says, but first, that is before any coming kingdom, he, son of man, Jesus talking about himself, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Now, once again, when the disciples hear this, they are most certainly saying, I wonder what in the world he means by that. If he's not going to be setting up his kingdom, why does he have to go through this suffering and rejection by this generation? What is he talking about? And what he's telling them is, guys, here's the problem. The problem is that there's going to be delay in the kingdom because of rejection. Rejection. Now, if that, if that sounds ominous, it's only because it is. And it is especially ominous for that generation of Jewish people. But by extension, it's ominous to anyone who ultimately rejects Jesus Christ. To reject Christ is the most ominous thing there is in the whole world. It's the worst thing anyone could possibly do. But, but in the long run, nothing thwarts the plan of God. So men may reject, but the plan of God will go forward. The human setback, in fact, will be used by God to forward his plan. This is a marvelous thing that we see over and over and over in Scripture. Jesus uses, I mean, the most frustrated being in the whole universe has to be the devil because everything that he ever does that he thinks is for evil, God somehow turns around to good. We can't see that all right now. We don't understand all of that right now. We will one day. And here's a great example of how God takes the evil of men and turns it to good. All of that is tied up in that one little verse, so let's unpack it in a little more detail. The, the verse contains bad news, but it also contains good news. The bad news, what is the bad news? Well, it's expressed succinctly in, in John's gospel in chapter one, verse 11, where John says, Jesus came into his own people, or came into his own people and they did not receive him. Oh, well, that's an extremely sad verse. When you think about the fact that the people of Israel have been God's people by the time Jesus arrives on the scene for 2,000 years, right? You go back to the time of Abraham, the time when, Jesus, when God selected Abraham and started the nation of Israel to be his means of communicating to the world. This is the way he revealed himself to the world, and that had been going on for 2,000 years. The nation of Israel had been special in that sense. He had promised them, he had promised them that they would have blessing if they would obey his commands, and he told them that they would have cursing if they rejected his commands. He delivered them from slavery in Egypt in the most wonderful 
physical object lesson of what spiritual salvation and deliverance is all about that has ever been in the history of the world. He established them in the land of Canaan. He gave them judges and he gave them kings and there were a lot of bright spots as Israel grew as a nation, especially during the time of David's reign and then following that, Solomon's reign. But for the most part, most of the time, Israel was a nation that lived in rebellion against the commands of God. They got entangled with the idolatrous gods of the nation and of the tribes around them. They began to worship those gods instead of the true God. And this resulted in eventually, after about a thousand years of this, of God delivering them first the northern tribes into the hands of the Assyrians in 722 BC, and then God delivering the southern tribes into the hands of the Babylonians in 600 BC, all because of their idolatry. But here's the thing we have to understand, beloved. The covenant that God made with Abraham was unconditional. I'm going to refer you to some passages today that we don't have time to look at, but if you read Genesis 15, you'll see how God illustrates the unconditional nature of his promises to Abraham. Unconditional covenant means God is saying, listen, I'm going to do what I have promised to you that I'm going to do, give you land, give you people, and give you prosperity and bless the whole world through you. I'm going to do that regardless of what you do and regardless of what your descendants do. Now, they will face the individual consequences of what they do, but I will stand firm on my promise. And God does stand firm on his promise. God's promise is not going to be thwarted by the fact that the Israelites lived in idolatry. And so God continues to promise an everlasting kingdom even while the Israelites are in captivity in Assyria and in Babylon. And particularly through Ezekiel and through Daniel, who were prophets who ministered during the time of the captivity, starting in 600 BC. Daniel, living in Babylon, and in fact, so did Ezekiel. Here came these promises that, no, this is not over with. There's coming a kingdom. It's going to be an everlasting kingdom. One of the greatest of those prophecies is found in Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. It's a wonderful prophecy. It, and it plays big time into this passage here in Luke 17, verse 25, when he says, but he must first suffer and be rejected. The, the word that's used there in the Greek, that, that he must suffer and be rejected. It's the little, little Greek word day. We've talked about it before. It means this is an absolute necessity. Why? This is what the disciples would be asking. Why? Well, two major reasons. Number one, he had to suffer to pay for the sins that were being committed by all the people around him so that there would be the possibility of forgiveness for those who would believe in him. No kingdom entrance, no spiritual kingdom, no earthly kingdom without the forgiveness of sins. And so they had to be paid for. It was necessary. But secondly, it was necessary because it had been prophesied. Multiple places in the Old Testament, it had been prophesied that there would be this Messiah who would come, and yes, he would rule and reign forever, but he would also be a suffering Messiah who would die and pay the penalty for the sins of the people. And Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27, is one of the most pivotal prophecies in the Old Testament. Now, listen, don't look there right now. When you get home, you can look there. We will look at it in more detail when we get into chapter 19. So I don't want to take time to go through, the, through all of it this morning, but here I want to summarize it for you. So just kind of hang on as I summarize the prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 through 27. It's a, it is not an easy prophecy to wrap your arms around, so I'm just going to give you the Cliff Notes version. In that prophecy, while the children of Israel are captive in Babylon, God assures Daniel, I'm not done with Israel yet. So here's a prophecy that's intended for your people and for your city, that's Jerusalem. So this prophecy is primarily about Israel in Daniel 9. And he says, here's what's going to happen. He says, there's going to be a period of 490 years. He actually calls it 70 periods of seven years each. We call them weeks of years. So you'll sometimes hear about the 70th week of Daniel or about this prophecy of the 70 weeks. That's what it is. But it's a period of 70 periods of seven weeks each, total of 490 years. I don't know why God chose 490. 
other than seven in the Bible represents it's a number of, of completion, right? A perfection. And what God promises is at the end of this 490 years, there's going to be an end to the transgression, that is the sin principle that resides in us. There's going to be an end to individual sins that we commit all the time. There's going to be atonement for sin. There's going to be the anointing of a holy place in Jerusalem. All of these things. In other, and there's going to be everlasting righteousness established on the earth. In other words, what he's saying is the kingdom is going to come. At the end of the 490 years, the kingdom is going to come. And then he tells Daniel, this kingdom is going to start when there is a decree issued for the Israelites who are in captivity to go back and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. That decree came about 90 years after Daniel got the prophecy. Daniel got the prophecy around somewhere around 536, 538 BC. The edict from Artaxerxes I, the Persian king who was in charge of them by that time, for them to go back and rebuild the city came in 445 BC, about 90 years later. Here came this decree that started this time clock for Israel's future. It's all prophesied there in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Now that prophecy also has an additional feature. It prophesies that there's going to be one who will come at the end of 69 of those periods of seven years each. In other words, at the end of 483 years, there's going to become, there's, there's going to land here on earth a Messiah. He's called an anointed one in that passage. Your Bible, depending on the translation, may actually say Messiah. The ESV translates it, anointed one, which is the real Hebrew word. It's the Hebrew word Mashiach, which means anointed one, which means Messiah. In the Greek, it's called Christ. This is why Jesus is called the Christ, the Messiah. He's going to come at the end of 483 years, but he's going to be cut off. It actually uses the word cut off. It's the form of the same word that's used in the Old Testament for circumcision. Colossians tells you how circumcision is, a, is another symbol of the death of Christ on our behalf. Circumcision, he's going to be cut off. That's what that prophecy says. Why? Because he's going to be rejected. Because he's going to be rejected. His own people did not receive him. So all of this was prophesied in that place as well as in others. Now, turn to Luke 19, because I think in Luke 19, Luke basically tells us the very day at the end of the 483 years, and some of you are quick at your addition. You're saying, well, wait a minute. Um, 444 BC to about 30 or 33 AD, depending on when Jesus died. That doesn't sound like quite 483. But if you take into account that prophecy, years, pro prophetic years in the Bible are 360 days long. That's always true. When you take into account the calendar changes that occurred, you land right in the middle of the ministry of Jesus when you come to the end of this 483. First 483 out of the 490 years. And I think this is where it happens. Luke 19, verse 41, look at this. This is Jesus entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. It says, and when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. Now that's amazing because what are the people doing? People are cheering. They're throwing down their coats. They're putting out palm branches. They are cheering him on. Why? because they think the Messiah has arrived. They think the kingdom is going to be here. He's going to come and kick the Romans out next week. This is great. That's what they think is happening. Jesus is weeping. Why? Verse 42 of Luke 19. He's saying, would you, would that you, even you, you people that are throwing out your clothes on the ground, that are throwing out the palm branches, would that you, even you, had known that on this day, this very day, the things that make for peace, I think that's the things promised in Daniel 9.24. The kingdom conditions that would 
come at the end of the 490 years. This day, these things are being offered to you. He's coming into town, riding on a donkey. He's allowing them for the first time in his earthly ministry to proclaim him as Messiah. He's offering himself as the king. And they are saying, yes, we want the outward kingdom, but no, we don't want the repentance that goes with it. They're gonna, the same people are going to crucify him before the end of the week. Jesus knew that. He goes on. He says, but now they are hidden from your eyes, the things that make for peace. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you. Jesus is predicting here what happened 40 years later in 70 AD when the Romans came into Jerusalem and did exactly what he predicted right here. They destroyed the city. Why? Because Israel as a nation rejected their Messiah. Israel as a nation said, we do not recognize him as our Messiah if he will not do this according to our plan and set up the kingdom now. We want nothing to do with repentance. Obviously, he's false. And what happened? God's time clock stopped at 483 years right at that time. That's exactly what happened. Delay in God's timetable. An indefinite delay. It's a delay that's been 2,000 years so far. Israel became a nation that was dispersed among the nations, persecuted everywhere they have gone since that time. Only lately, since 1948, have they been able to return to their land as a nation. It's the only, only ancient nation in history that you can look at and say, oh boy, they came back. You don't see any revival of the Hittites, right, or the Jebusites, or the Moabites, or any of them, but you see Israel back in the land. Why did all this happen? Look at Luke 19, verse 44. Jesus says to these same people, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Here I am. You didn't recognize it. They missed their Messiah. The most privileged generation in the history of mankind rejected their only hope. Instead of the coronation day that it could have been, Palm Sunday was... Rejection day. They basically said, so what? If you won't do what we want you to do, if you won't come into town and kick the Romans out, which by the way is exactly what he didn't do. We'll see it when we get there. But Jesus rode into town that day and you know what he did instead of kicking the Romans out, which they thought? He went to the temple and kicked the Jewish leaders out. That's why they hated him. What a human tragedy. The clock stopped. Is the clock done for good? No, it's not. The stopwatch will be initiated again one day. Romans 9 through 11 makes very clear God is not done with Israel. He will never break the promise of Genesis 15. He will fulfill it to the letter in his time and in his way. But Israel is on hold until God takes the church out of the world at the rapture that we talked about last year, until the times of the Gentiles are finished, which is what Jesus calls them himself in Luke 21. I think it's verse 46, the times of the Gentiles. What does that mean? The times when the Gentiles are, are predominantly take, take, uh, ruling over the Jewish people. Suddenly that clock is going to start again. We're going to have the seven years of tribulation at the end of which the nation of Israel will turn in mass to recognize the Messiah that they have denied up until now. But delay was caused by what? Rejection. What they could have had in that generation didn't happen. Now what if they hadn't rejected? I don't know. I think the clock would have kept right on going. Jesus would have still had to die because there still had to be remission of sins. There still had to be sins paid for. All of that would have happened. The events that are prophesied in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, especially in the 70th week, the last seven-year period, would have had to happen. But I think it could have been fulfilled right then in that generation and they rejected it's bad news, isn't it? Bad news for Israel. Bad news for those who lived in that generation. That's what Jesus is saying. But listen, 
There's also good news in this verse. There's great news in this verse, in fact. What's the great news? Well, look at it again, verse 25, back in Luke 17. Verse 25. He says, but he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. You say, well, that's the bad news. Yes, it is, but guess what? It's also the best news that was ever delivered to mankind. It's the best news ever. Why? Because it's the means by which Jesus will provide forgiveness, not only for that generation of Israel on those who will believe, but on anyone, anywhere, anytime who will believe. That's good news. It's the same, you know, we have an example of this in the Old Testament. Remember how, remember how Joseph, Abraham's great-grandson, was sold into slavery down into Egypt, remember? And he went down into Egypt, and eventually it turned out that God put him there for a reason after all of his adventures there. He became the second in command in the Egyptian nation so that he could save the people from famine. And the people that God was particularly wanted to save was the Israelites who were still living in Canaan. And so Joseph's brothers came down not knowing it was him and bought the grain and they were saved from the famine. Remember all of that? And then Joseph, when, they, when he revealed himself to him, he brought them all down there to live with him in Egypt. He said, come on, come on down, live here with me. I can take care of you. And so they all did. But 17 years after that, dad died. Jacob passed away. And the brothers sent a note to Joseph and said, Joseph, please, please, dad would not like you to kill us. We know you're probably still mad. They had no reason to believe that. Joseph had forgiven them over and over and over again. He gave them the best land in, in Egypt in order to, 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 to shepherd their herds. He took great care of them, but they were scared to death still. They were plagued by guilt. And they said, don't, 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 don't do anything that dad wouldn't want you to do. Then you have this great verse in Genesis 50, verse 20. When Joseph said to them, listen, I know what you meant for evil. I know you meant it. When you sold me into slavery, I know you meant it for evil. But guess what? God meant it for good. God meant it for good. You thought you were doing this of your own free will and volition, and you were. You thought, think now you're going to be responsible for that, and you are. But God had a plan all along. God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And that's the same thing that's happening in, Je in Jesus' generation. You see that? Jesus' generation meant for evil against him when they killed him, but God meant it for the ultimate good in the history of mankind. He meant it for the salvation, for the possibility of salvation of all who would believe in him so that by his death, by his death, he became a ransom for many, according to Mark 10, 45. When they killed him, his own people, they did it so that, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, according to Hebrews 2, 14. Their rejection became our redemption. Isaiah understood this 700 years before it ever happened. Isaiah understood what was going to happen and why. Isaiah prophesied this way in Isaiah 53. He said, yet it was the will of the Father of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt, paying for sin in his death, our sin. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. That's resurrection prophesied 700 years before it happened. And all of that so that what? So that the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Wow. What they intended for evil, God intended for good. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it this way. He made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Without this, there would be no end to sin. There would be no end to the transgression. There would be no atonement. There would be no establishment of everlasting righteousness. There would be no coming kingdom. There would be no coming in glory for the, for the, for the Lord Jesus Christ. There would be no kingdom. There would be no nothing of eternal value without this. Without the suffering that Jesus went through. 
Not without that. But see, God's eternal plans will never be thwarted. No devil, no man, no person, no one that ever lived, no strong one, no Hillary, no Donald, no anybody can thwart the plans of God. You can't. The, the plans of God will go forward, beloved, regardless. Here's the greatest illustration of what humans could do to try and thwart the plan of God, and it didn't thwart anything. It played right into his hands. God's ways are not our ways. Let me tell you, they are way better. We used to, we used to have a hard time believing that. God's ways are better. He turned rejection into redemption. Now, I think this is why Jesus says, you know, in Matthew 13, he gives a whole bunch of parables to tell us what the kingdom of God is like. So if you want to read what the kingdom is like, what heaven is like sometime, read Matthew 13. But one of them he says is this, Matthew 13, this is in verse 45. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went away and sold all that he had and bought it. Why did Jesus use a pearl? Why not a diamond? Why not an, an emerald, you know, whatever else is really good? Pearl, gem, I don't know gems very well. Lazuli, I know that's one. I have no idea what it looks like. I just read it in the Bible. But, you know, you have all these fancy stuff. Why did he choose pearl? I think he chose pearl for this reason. Where do you get a pearl? A pearl starts with a wound. And then it becomes a pearl through what? Through the healing power of God. It's an illustration of how the kingdom of God comes through the greatest wound that could ever or was ever imposed on anybody on the person of Jesus Christ. But out of that came the healing power of God, not only in the life of Christ now, but in the life of everyone who will ever believe. It's good news, isn't it? The kingdom of God is built on the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died a savior, he rose a king. Sang about it this morning. He sang vigorously, thank you. About the king. What great truths. And so now he's ready to inaugurate the kingdom when, at whatever time the father says, okay, that's it, let's go. Just waiting for that right time. Don't know when it'll happen. Don't think it'll be long. He's coming again. But his coming is delayed by rejection which is bad for those who reject him, but it's good for everybody else. Then there's a fifth thing about the kingdom here that we can look at today, and that is that Jesus' coming is unexpected in its timing. Verses 26 through 28, Jesus' coming is unexpected in its timing. He talks about the time of Noah. People were just eating and drinking, marrying giving in marriage, same in Lot's time, and he adds the fact that they were you know, doing business. That's what he means when he talks about the fact that they were buying and selling and so on. They were just doing business. But Jesus' coming will be unexpected in its timing. For many, it will be unexpected, period. Now, the reason he uses this illustration about eating and drinking and marrying and so on is he's just saying, look, these, these are just the normal things that go on in the course of life, Right? There's nothing more to it than that. He's saying life will be going on in its normal processes, its normal rhythms. And people will begin to think, okay, it's been this way for 100 years now, and now it's been this way since the time of Noah, now it's been for 200 years, now it's been for 1,000 years. This is never going to change. Things are always going to go on just like this. People will be living, marrying, giving in marriage. They'll be going about their business, buying and selling. Things will go on this way forever. There was no sense in Noah's day that judgment was coming. Noah preached it for 120 years, it says, and nobody believed. Things are just going to keep on going on. And then the flood came in the case of Noah, and then the fire fell in the case of Gomorrah, and guess what? Judgment did come, just like God said it would. Surprise, surprise. It was all true. going to be a whole world of people one day that will suddenly realize, whoa, wait a minute, it was all true. Things will not go on forever. Peter warned about this. Turn with me to 2 Peter. This is really kind of an interesting passage of Scripture, especially in light of our own 
day, 2 Peter. You're almost to the end of the New Testament. Get to Revelation, back up to John, and then 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3. Peter faced the same problem that we do. 2 Peter 3, verse 3. It says, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. So he tells us why they scoff, because they want to just go on sinning. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, things are just going on like they always have, marrying, giving in marriage, buying and selling. Everything is the same. Second coming is a myth. I know you guys are talking about that. I know you think you saw somebody named Jesus and he died and you buried him and now you think he's alive and he's going to come again. It's all a bunch of rubbish. That was going on 30 years after the time of Christ. No wonder people 2,000 years are saying the same thing, right? How many of your friends and relatives think this is all a bunch of garbage? Not that many people around who actually believe that Jesus is going to come to earth again one day. They are very few and far between. It's a myth. It's fairy tales. It's preposterous. It's a religious boogeyman. If it makes you feel better, fine. But it isn't going to happen. Peter has an answer. Verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. What a potent reminder, right? In God time, it's been two days since the first coming of Christ. Two days. Of course, that's not meant to be taken literal. It's just telling us God isn't bound by time like we are. He lives outside of time. Time doesn't mean anything. Delay doesn't mean cancellation. The promises will still be accomplished, just like Jesus said. So if you're going to scoff and go down the road and say it's been 2,000 years, realize it's for your sake that it's been that long. It's to give you opportunity to repent. Jesus and God isn't willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Use the time for that. Romans 2, 4 says God is forbear his, his forbearance is for the purpose, what? Of, that we would repent. It's just giving opportunity. The rhythm of life one day, beloved, will be dramatically interrupted when Jesus comes crashing in. He will. Nothing can stop that. Cancellation or delay does not mean cancellation. He is coming again. So we have, on the one hand, all these people over here who just won't buy that, won't believe that, to think life is going to go on as it has since time immemorial. And then we have another group over here that are saying, oh yeah, but we know, you know what? We know when Jesus is coming. We know. A bunch of codes in the Bible that we figured out nobody else figured out. Man, we've encoded it. We put it into a computer and we got it. This is nothing new. Hippolytus of Rome said it's going to be in 500 AD. He was wrong. A whole bunch of people said in around 1,000, it's going to, 1,000, that's when it's going to happen. Midnight, 1,000, didn't happen. William Miller, who founded the Seventh-day Adventists said, 1944, took a whole bunch of people in New York out there on a hill, they quit their jobs, they went out, and they're just waiting. Didn't happen. Charles Taze Russell, the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses, I don't know why it seems like uh, these cults get on this, 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 this craze, but they do. He said it was going to be in 1874. Didn't happen. So he kept making new dates up until about 1914, by which time he was dead, but the Jehovah's Witnesses finally gave up, and they said, he came, nobody just, nobody saw him. Came, came, came spiritually. They believe that. You can find it in their literature. Herbert W. Armstrong, first he predicted 1936, then 1943, then 1972, then 1975, before he finally gave up predicting. Harold Camping in our day, September 6, 1994. 
You remember the signs, May 21st, 2011. I can remember riding down the, the road and seeing the big signs. Be ready, May 21st, 2011. Well, that didn't happen. He was very apologetic. And he said, well, okay, I got it wrong. It was October 21st, 2011. That didn't happen. So he died. I, you know, I don't mean to make fun of him, but he was, he, 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 he was, he was apoplectic. Jack Van Impey. 2012 was the last one after many attempts before he finally gave up. And there are still some out there. Jean Dixon predicted 2020. Now, I don't know why she's predicting anything. She, there wasn't anything Christian about her that I know about. But somehow she thought, Jesus is coming. It's 2020. F. Kenton B. B. Shore, who was the father of one of the guys I went to seminary with. 2021. So you still have opportunities. Listen. Listen. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. You won't be able to miss it when it happens, but nobody knows when Jesus is coming. We got people saying, well, okay, but what, yeah, there's going to be signs in the sky. Joel 2, Luke 21, Matthew 24, predicts signs in heavens when he's coming. Yes, it does. But listen to this in, Ma in Mark chapter 13. Let me just read it for you, which clarifies that those things are so close to the event as to be part of the event. Here's what he says, Mark 13, verse 24, but in those days after that, after that tribulation, that's seven years we've talked about, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from the heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Those aren't timelines, those are accompanying signs. If anyone tells you they know when Jesus is coming again, move on. No one knows. Jesus himself did not know. Put that in your, you know, you don't have a pipe? Think about that. <laughs> Think about that. Jesus himself didn't know. He says that. Matthew 24, verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. I mean, if Jesus didn't know in his earthly existence, what in the world gives us the thought that somehow God's going to reveal it to us? Give me a break. Who do we think we are? So when you find date setters, let me tell you what you can, here's what you can do. You can be sure that when somebody tells you a date, you can be pretty sure it isn't going to happen on that day. <laughs> That's what you can be pretty sure of. Because Jesus said it's going to come at a time you do not expect. Well, I didn't even keep the disciples from trying. We get to... First chapter of Acts, after the death, resurrection, they're coming back and asking Jesus, is now the time? Is it Acts 1 7? Is, or Acts 1 6? Is now the time when you're going to set up the kingdom? Finally, we're going to have the kingdom. And Jesus tells him, What? It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father is fixed by his authority. If it wasn't for them to know, why do we think it is for us to know? It is not. It's just going to be unexpected. You know what it's going to be like? Here's what it's going to be like. There's this picture. I've told you about it before, but Sir John Millay, the great English artist. It's not a, it's not a full picture. It's a, it's a sketch they found in his, in his leftovers, but he's, he, he did this sketch, and it shows a wedding going on. There's a, there's, a, there's a bride and groom, and they're standing there looking at each other, about to kiss at the end of the wedding, and there's a man holding up his, his hand in blessing, one of the fathers or whoever is officiating, but on his but, but his hand is kind of frozen in midair and his eyes have opened up in terror. And there's a woman standing over at the side and she's looking out a window and her eyes are filled with terror. What are they seeing? They are seeing the water rising outside and in their mind's eye, what they're saying is, according to the caption at the bottom, so Noah was right. Noah was right. That's what the coming of the Son of Man is going to be like. So Jesus was right. So the Bible was right all along. 
Sooner or later, beloved, we have to decide where we're gonna, what, what is the ultimate authority in our life? Is it the word of God or is it the word of man? I'm going with the word of God. Why has God left us in the dark it's to the exact time of Jesus' return? I, I, that's not hard, is it? Why has he left us in the dark about that? I'll tell you why, because when we expect at any time, you have no choice but to be ready all the time, right? If you expect at any time, you gotta be ready all the time. That's what he wants. I mean, if you know it's gonna happen on May 5th, you know, 2024, what are you gonna do? I know you, because I know me, <laughs> right? We're gonna fill up our pleasure cup until May 4th, right? Come on. Jesus wants us living in the expectation that he's gonna come any time. We cannot be indifferent about the plans of God. C.S. Lewis, in his screw tape letters, he has the head devil, you know, screw tape, says this to his nephew demon who's out working on people like us. He says, it is not wickedness but indifference that we are after. And then he cautions this, you know, imp to keep his patient comfortable at all costs. Keep him comfortable, keep him at ease. Let him watch his television and see his, eat his meals and all of that stuff. He says, don't let him think about anything of importance and encourage him to think about his lunch plans. In other words, trivialities. And then he concludes by saying this. He says, I, the devil, will always see to it that there are really bad people. Your job, my dear Wormwood, is to provide me with people who do not care. People who say concerning the word of God, it's not true. It's been 2,000 years, never happened. Churchill said this about one of his enemies. He said he occasionally stumbled over the truth, but he hastily picked himself up and hurried on as if nothing had happened. Don't treat the truth of Jesus like that. So easy to do. It's been 2,000 years. Jesus has been long gone from the scene. Jesus to most people is, you know, strange pictures, strange medieval pictures on the wall. That is not who Jesus is. Jesus is alive and well. Jesus is just waiting for the moment when the Father says, go, and he will come because he's coming again. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We pray that uh, you will challenge us with the message of your word. We pray that you will help us since this coming can be any time to be prepared all the time. Help us to be living lives, Father, that will be pleasing to you. Lord, that doesn't take away the fun. It, it enhances the joy <laughs> to live a godly life. Help us to do that. Occupy till you come, is what you said. Be about the business. So help us to do that. For the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.